So thanks a lot. To appreciate the opportunity for to talk about Winlink. Um, I was going to do this in January, but uh, was able to, to put this together pretty quickly. Uh, my name is Mike McPherson. I think almost everybody knows me. So, uh, oh, turn it on. That works better. There we go. Uh, I'm going to di digress just a, a little bit. I talked a couple, three months ago, about uh, satellite stuff that's going on at the University of Virginia, and uh, we're all excited because we've been assigned to a mission. Uh, we are on ALANA 21. ALANA is it's an acronym for Educational Launch and Na something, Nano Satellite something. I can't remember what the acronym stands for, but it's, it's NASA's CubeSat launch initiative. And uh, we've been assigned to Mission 25. Um, and uh, there are going to be 11 CubeSats going up on that. Three of them will be the Virginia CubeSat Consortium satellites, and then there'll be eight others from other, mostly universities. Most of the set CubeSats that get launched under Atlanta are university built, although there have been a couple of high schools that have built and launched satellites as well, including one up in Northern Virginia. Uh, so we, uh, we will be expected to hand our satellites over to NanoRax, which is the launch uh, company. Uh, they they build the deploying device. Uh, you can see the deployment device here. It attached, attaches to the end of the uh, remote manipulator arm on the Japanese module, and uh, and they can put in this particular configuration four uh, stacks of satellites. I think they can put up to six 1U cubesats in each of the tubes, so they can put 12. <laughs> I think 12 1U CubeSats in, in that uh, deployment device. And then they stick it out into space and, and press the button and springs spit your satellite out into space. Uh, and the, the satellite, uh, the, they launch um, anti-grade, so they, they launch forward uh, in the orbit. And the CubeSats uh, depart the launcher at about a meter, meter and a half per second, so they do separate from the space station. Uh, will likely launch in uh, the last half, sometime the last half of uh, 2018 on a shuttle resupply, or a space station resupply mission. Uh, those things are squishy. Uh, there's a lot of negotiating and rescheduling and shuffling around that happens with CRS missions, crew resupply missions, and, um, and so it's not possible to say precisely what launch vehicle, vehicle will be on, where it's going to launch from, uh, odds would say orbital ATK from Wallops, but it's not guaranteed. And um, uh, probable deployment from the space station sometime in the last quarter of 2018 or the first quarter of 2019. So uh, I'll give you more information on that when the time comes. Also, if you pay attention to these things, uh, the next Fox, MSAT Fox satellite uh, was supposed to launch two days ago and uh, somebody flew into the restricted area, flew their, their private plane into the restricted area. They had to scrub the launch. Something happened yesterday. I'm not sure what it was. And they're going to try again tomorrow morning. So if you're interested, take a peek. OK, Winlink. Pressing on. What is Winlink? So uh, I think it's pretty simple. Winlink is email. But unlike the email that all of us use every day, or most of us use every day, Winlink adds amateur radio as one of the transport options. So uh, normal, a normal email mail chain goes like this. You sit in front of your, your computer, you click send. The email program, Outlook or, or uh, Thunderbird or whatever you use on your, uh, your computer, contacts a mail server someplace. This is a computer sitting in a big noisy room that's way too cold, and its job is to process email to hold it and move it on to the sender. Uh, that mail server, depending on what the destination address is, may contact another mail server. So for example, if I send, um, my email goes through a hosting company called DreamHost, which happens to host our website too, the club's website. Um, and if I send to somebody who's got a, uh, uh, a Mac.com address, then the DreamHost mail server is going to contact the mail server that supports Mac.com. And the mail sits there until the person I sent the email to checks in to get their mail next time. And their mail program, Outlook or whatever, calls up to the Mac. It's probably not Outlook if it's Mac.com. Uh, calls up to the mail server and says, give me everything you've got for me. And that email ends up on their desktop. 
So that's the way it normally works. Uh, these are all internet connections. But it doesn't have to work that way. So with, um, with WinLink, WinLink will use internet connections if it's available. WinLink's very pragmatic. It's not, it's not dogmatic, it must be radio. Uh, WinLink is all about communicating, and it's all about communicating particularly in emergency situations um, or situations uh, that where you don't have internet. But a lot of what it's being used for now is emergency communication. So if the internet's available, it'll use it. But any of these paths, can you can replace the internet with amateur radio. And in fact, <clears throat> you can replace uh, any of these connections with pretty much any band of amateur radio that we have, have access to. Uh, the, I think the majority of the WinLink traffic goes over VHF, but you can also have a UHF gateway. A lot of people use HF, um, and uh, WinLink supports operating over a microwave mesh network, uh, like the ARDN or the HAM, HAMWAN or one of those networks. So uh, every step along the way can use amateur radio. Um, so, that makes sense? It's email, except it goes over the radio. Uh, some of the advantages are it is worldwide, and I'll show you some maps here in a minute of, of what WinLink looks like around the world, the infrastructure that's in place. Um, it is uh, fully error detected and corrected. Every link has full error correction, so it is 100% accurate end to end. Uh, you don't have to worry about losing stuff, getting stuff garbled. Um, it looks like normal old email. Uh, from, from 20 feet away, it looks like you're running Outlook on your desktop. Uh, you get closer, you see some differences, but it works like email. And it's inter interconnected with the internet. So in fact, you can send email to and from any internet connected email address. Uh, and because the connections to the radio mail servers are initiated by licensed amateur radio operators as long as the content of the message conforms with amateur radio rules. You don't have to worry about third party issues. The, 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 it's the hand that's initiating the transmission. And the gateways are all operated by amateur radio operators. Uh, there are some disadvantages. It, it's got more moving parts. It's, so it's more complex than just talking on the radio or doing Morse code. Um, it requires a little extra hardware. I'm going to contend that it's not that much extra hardware. And it requires some new skills. But you know, I'm trying to learn CW right now, and I think WinLink's easier. You guys who've been speaking CW for decades would probably disagree with me. But, uh, but I think WinLink's pretty straightforward. Um, it's not blazingly fast in most of the modes, but uh, for the sorts of things that we need to send around in an emergency, it's not bad. So uh, I, d I, d I generated a quick 17-word radiogram and figured out how long it would take uh, to send in each of these modes. On VHF and UHF, it uses the standard packet protocols. And it would take, um, on VHF, the one that most people use, take about 30 seconds to transmit a 17-word radiogram. Remember, that's 100% accurate, no fills, no repeats. Um, uh, there are two, there's a mode called PACTOR. It's an HF digital mode. Uh, the one that we're allowed to use in the US is PACTOR 3. It's considerably faster. PACTOR 4 is available in other countries, but it's not yet, that emission mode is not yet approved by the FCC, so we can't use it. And then there are a couple of, and these are proprietary modems. You can only buy the modem. It's a hardware modem. You can only buy it from one company in Germany, and they charge an arm and leg for it. Uh, a lot of folks use something called Winmore, which is a sound card HF mode. It's open source, uh, developed by a community of hams as an alternative to Pactor. I didn't, <coughs> and, and it uses, uh, it, it's, it's a packet protocol, but it's a packet protocol that's tweaked for HF and for HF propagation conditions. And then I didn't put another column on here, but there's one coming. Uh, everybody hopes that sometime in 2018, uh, WinLink is going to switch over to something called RDOP, Amateur Radio Digital Something Protocol. I can't remember what the O stands for. Uh, it is the next generation HF packet protocol, again, developed 
uh, open, in an open environment by a bunch of hands. And uh, speeds for RDOP, uh, you can run RDOP right now. You can use it in a chat mode um, over, over your HF rig. Um, speeds fall somewhere between Pactor 3 and Pactor 4, but it's open source. Uh, don't have to don't have to buy a two or three thousand dollar hardware TNC uh, that's single sourced. Uh, there is a uh, uh, the WinLink client that most people use called WinLink Express uh, supports forms. Uh, there all of the ICS forms are in there. Uh, all of the AWRL uh, radiogram and other standard league forms are in there. Lots of international forms and. Uh, um, Greg KW6GB developed a form to support the VDEM county SITREP uh, form that all the counties have to submit in, in an actual emergency in Virginia. And so I just filled out a, a SITREP, uh, example SITREP, and figured out how long it would send and it would take to send, and you can see uh, how long that takes. And for the very brief check in for the weekly Wednesday WinLink net, uh, you know, it takes six or seven seconds to transmit that message to check into the, the weekly uh, WinLink net that Greg runs. So it's not blindingly fast, but it's not bad. Anyway, you, question, you can do actual work with it. Are these yeah. protocols, I mean, are they like full blown IETF RFCs or it's not in that realm? Uh, so the, so uh, the, the packet protocols are, RFCs? that's AX25, okay. uh, okay. which is the oh, amateur. Yeah, it's AX25 packet. Yeah. So they use the existing RFCs? Yeah. And, uh, you know, I don't know whether they've done an RFC for Winmore. I wouldn't be surprised. But, okay. uh, and I'm pretty sure that there is one for RDAP. So yeah, it's all, all open standards and open source code. And if you want to get involved in developing RDOP and you like to write, write uh, uh, modulators and demodulators in and, and machine language, then get on the website and volunteer. OK. So the next question is that I always, people always ask me, what, what's WinLink's purpose? And for, for my, from my point of view, although you can do anything with amateur radio, uh, with WinLink that you could do with amateur radio, any content that's legal for, for amateur radio is legal in WinLink. So if you want to, you can just chit chat with your ham buddies, anybody who has a WinLink address, and any ham can get a WinLink address. Um, and you could use it for routine communications between amateur radio operators. And, uh, and if you, if you originate and send your messages uh, using your radio, then you know most of the way it's on a day-to-day -day basis it's amateur radio. So you could argue yourself argue to yourself you're doing ham radio. Um, I don't think it's what most people would think of as ham radio, but the big advantage is for emergency communication. Um, Winlink, and it used to be called uh, WL2K Winlink 2000, but now it's just Winlink. Um, WinLink is a part of the communications structure for amateur radio in the United States. Uh, just like the national traffic system is part of the emergency communication structure and all of the local repeaters and point to uh, uh, simplex and other resources that ARIES units around the country use are all part of the infrastructure. Um, NTS is structured very much, uh, e even the digital side, there is a digital side of NTS, NTSD. But it's structured very much the way NTS is with cycles and, um, uh, and stations at different levels checking in uh, during certain cycles. So um, NTS, uh, in addition to CW and phone, can also move digital traffic, but it can take a while for a piece of traffic to get from source to destination uh, because of the cycle thing. WinLink is pretty much instantaneous. It takes as long as it takes for the radios or the internet connections in the hops to move that traffic from source to destination. So, so with WinLink, you could get a message from one side of the country to the other side of the country in a few minutes. I'm going to show three slides. The important thing isn't exactly where the dots are located. I would say the takeaway here is that, that there each of these uh, green markers is a WinLink gateway. It's a, it's a computer 
that has internet connectivity most of the time or all of the time, barring disaster, and that has radios connected to it <coughs> at, that are sitting there waiting, <coughs> waiting on certain frequencies to be contacted by a, an endpoint. Uh, this happens to be a bunch of HF gateways running Pactor. So as you can see, the HF gateways are scattered pretty well across the world. This is HF gateways running Winmore, the open protocol. Uh, most HF gateways do both Pactor and Winmore. And, and when Winmore gets retired and replaced by RDOP, they'll probably do Pactor and RDOP. Uh, and this is uh, VHF and UHF gateways, which are good as far as VHF and UHF is good for. So the thing, this is back to the Winmore gateways. So even though WinLink relies on the internet for day-to-day -day connectivity between these gateways and the mail servers, and the central mail servers that are the, central, the, the hub of the WinLink infrastructure. Um, they can all be communicated with over HF as well. Uh, I run right now one WinLink gateway. It's up at W4UVA, just up the hill here. It's only on VHF on a day-to-day -day basis, but in a very few minutes, I could put, I could attach an HF rig to it, and if the internet, if we lost our internet here in Albemarle County, I could drive up there, connect an HF rig to that gateway, and start relaying email from Albemarle County over HF to one of these other nodes that still had internet. The presumption with WinLink is that somebody somewhere in the, wor in the world is still going to have internet connectivity. If everybody loses the internet, then we're hosed anyway. And, and you know, I'm not going to be worrying about it. Yeah. Yeah, there won't be anybody talking to anybody if that happens. So the presumption is that internet outages are going to be relatively localized. And so all you need to be able to do is get out of your area in order to get to the internet and from there to anybody in the world. Um, you can, <coughs> excuse me, uh, so endpoints can use HF, uh, and in fact, uh, Dave every week checks into the Wednesday Virginia Wind Lake net over HF, so you're connecting to, where do you connect to? What uh, gateway do you usually use? It, it depends on the time of day. Depends on time of day and propagation. Be on, on, uh, 40 or 80 yeah, so it's typically so 40 or 80. Yeah. Um, I, I have antenna challenges, so I usually check in VHF, but occasionally I drag a coax outside and set up my Envis antenna, and I, if I'm doing HF, I usually do something nearby, Leesburg or Richmond or somebody, one of the local nearby HF gateways. So the point is, you can get to a gateway somewhere in the world at any given time. There are enough of them, and uh, propagation is going to be good in some direction or another. Uh, this is the VHF gateways in the United States. You know, there's some holes. I was on vacation in Nova Scotia. There are only, uh, last month, there are only two VHF gateways in Nova Scotia, and, I, and from where we were staying, I couldn't get to either one of them. Uh, so they could use some filling in. Uh, we have four gateways, uh, either up and running or in the works. Jack runs a gateway at his house up outside of Rutgersville. Uh, Mike runs a gateway up here outside of Orange on a pretty tall tower. He, uh, he does, um, uh, he does um, wireless networks for a living, and he's a tower climber and has access to towers. So his, his gateway is up pretty high up there. This is the gate, VHF gateway up at W4UVA, and uh, the CVRA, Central Virginia Repeater Association, is going to put a gateway at its repeater site at Wintergreen. Uh, it's sitting in my shack. Uh, I need to do some soldering, but it's pretty close to being ready. Sometime in the next couple of weeks, I hope to drive down there with Gordon and put that uh, gateway on the air. And that'll fill in the area down to the south here pretty well. There's a Because of this, the location on the side of O'Hill, um, the uh, W4UVA gateway doesn't provide much coverage south of town, so this will fill in south of town pretty well. Yeah. What are the numbers? Uh, so the, the numbers at the end are what are called uh, SSIDs. It's a packet thing. 
um, you can have uh, associated with your call sign, you can have multiple um, sort of serial number identifiers after your call sign, other way for you. And, um, uh, you know, one of them might be your car, one of them might be your HT, one might be your home uh, radio. And, uh, and the convention for Winlink gateways is dash 10. Most Winlink gateways are dash 10. So all those you can see, not all. I'm sorry? The dash two up there. Uh, he runs several Winlink gateways, and uh -huh. he probably, his dash 10 is somewhere else. And he had to pick some new numbers. Um, <clears throat> I've got the hardware to put a UHF radio on the on the gateway here, and that'll you know that'll be dash eleven or something. I'll have to pick another number you for that one. Multiple radios on the one. Here. Yeah, and many gateways have multiple radios on one on one gateway. Yeah, it's common. So, next question you might be asking is, can I do this? And I would argue, yes, you can do this. You need a radio. You need a radio that you can hook up some sort of digital device to. Uh, you need to be able to do sound card, or you need to be able to plug in a TNC to have the little six pin DIN connector on it for a t hardware TNC. Um, so you, you're going to need a TNC, terminal node controller, a modem. It's the radio packet radio version uh, word for modem. Uh, I actually prefer the software TNCs, and there are folks who have taken the common hardware VHF TNC, TNCs like the, the KPC-3 that lots and lots of people have. I have one. I have a couple, actually. Um, and, and pitted them against, uh, there are a couple of open source software TNCs, uh, and, uh, and the software TNCs routinely whip the hardware TNCs. Uh, the software TNCs beat the, the very best hardware TNCs, uh, hands down, both in uh, op optimal conditions and high noise conditions. So I really recommend that you use a software TNC. Um, and if you're going to do that, all you need is a sound card interface to connect your computer to your radio. And you'll need to be able to, to do push to talk. So you'll need uh, audio in, audio out, and push to talk. So it's a really simple interface. It can be a couple of little um, 600 ohm transformers and a and a transistor to do the, to isolate the push to talk, and, and you're up and running. Um, for HF, uh, that's all software, um, unless you're going to use one of these Pactor modems. But I don't recommend you do that. Uh, not, it's not worth it, especially with with RDAP coming along. So there, it's just sound card, and in fact, the uh, uh, the HF TNC, the Winmore TNC, is built into the the client, the the Winlink client on Windows. And uh, and like say, you can run it over Mesh as well. Um, the uh, the clients support connecting to a, 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 a mail gateway at an IP address, and so if you run a mesh network. The, this gateway has an IP address. My gateway has an IP address on the mesh network that we've got up and running here in, in Albemarle County. And so if you were on that mesh network, you would just say connect to the IP address instead of connecting uh, over VHF or, or HF. But it would be going over amateur radio. The mesh network is operating under my amateur radio license. And the software is all free and open source. Yeah? So is there a specific frequency that's sort of allocated to this? Uh, no, no. It, so it's not like APRS where you have a single frequency nationwide. Uh, each gateway has its own frequencies. There is a lot of reuse. Uh, so um, the W4UVA VHF is 145.510, I think. And there are three or four other gateways in the country that use that same frequency, but not around here. So that's, a, I guess that's in the packet range of... Yeah, it's in. I I talked to the uh, Bill. I'm blanking. Our frequency regional frequency Sarah. coordinators. Oh, Sarah. Yeah, Sarah. I I talked to the the guy who covers this part of Virginia for Sarah, and we had a long conversation about appropriate frequency selections. And and there's a band that's designed for digital uh, simplex modes. Uh, 
So you do have to have a coordinator, or you don't want to? Sarah does not coordinate gateways, but they were happy to talk to me about it. They were, they were glad I asked, but they don't actually coordinate gateways. Yeah, because they're not repeaters. So they're, the gateways are all simplex operations. Um, <clears throat> and you can put multiple gateways on the same frequency, but it starts to cause trouble after a while. Uh, a lot of the gateways in Virginia use the uh, 145.730 frequency. And, <clears throat> and in fact, I started this one off on that frequency. And it was so noisy. The background noise was so high that the error rate was tremendous. I was doing retry after retry or re after retry. It would take me that, that um, check-in that I can do in seven seconds now on, on my discrete frequency might take a couple of minutes on 730 because the, 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 the noise floor was so high that it was doing multiple retries for every packet. Um, and I'm betting that a bunch of you are driving around with one of those in your car. That has a hardware VHF, UHF, TNC built into it. All you need is a serial cable to connect to your computer and you can do wind link in your car. That's the 710, D710. Uh, the D700 also has a T TNC in it. Uh, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do demo tonight on my uh, THD72, which has the same uh, TNC in it. Uh, the color version of this, the 74, color tri-band version, has TNC in it. Um, there, and, and there's at least one other Kenwood yeah, HT that has the, and the TS2000 has TNC in it. Yeah. So a lot of the Kenwood rigs have packet TNCs in them. And if you've got one of those, all you need is a cable to connect it to your computer and, and a serial cable, or in this case, USB, and you're up and running. And the, the WinLink software supports these built-in TNCs uh, directly. So then you don't need a sound call anymore? Don't need any of that, yeah. OK, this is the uh, portion of the presentation where things go sour very quickly. <laughs> USB cable. Kenwood, in its infinite wisdom, has decided to go with micro USB, which turns out to be hard to find anymore. I mean, mini, mini uh, USB. Mini. I said micro. I meant mini. Oh. It's mini USB. The, the standard for cell phones is micro, so you can get a micro USB cable anywhere. Uh, mini USB. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got enough to stretch around the world twice, I think. Yeah. Um, mini USB, if you want one, you've got to order it. Uh, but they're cheap. And so this, this particular radio just plugs in. Just plugs into a USB port. Yes, I'm on the screen. Good deal. OK. I'm going to turn the radio on, and it's in packet mode, and it's tuned to the frequency for the gateway up the hill. So I say, I want to do packet, and I open up my My session, I tell it which gateway I want to connect to. I tune the radio to the right frequency. And <laughs> and I. So kind of getting back to the question, how do you know the right frequency? Must be a direct frequency. Well, you can actually hear it on that one. Yep. Yeah. 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 I've got incoming mail. I've got two messages coming in. I 
There was one. You get the green progress bar across the top. There's the other one, and the session's done. Yeah. So I'm holding it up in the air because apparently when I transmitted it, wigged out the AV control system here. Yeah. <laughs> like that. Um, and maybe it'll come back to life here in a second. There we go. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna turn the radio off so it doesn't do that again. Uh, I've got it set for five. I was just too lazy to turn it down. I doubt that I needed that from down here. So um, uh, there's a little handshake at the beginning, and then uh, the client on my computer asks the radio mail server uh, if it has any traffic for me. It says, yes, I have two messages I need to send you. There's another little handshake. My computer says, OK, go ahead and send the first one. It sends it. Uh, another little handshake. Go ahead and send the second one. Sends it. Uh, session is over. That's sort of the equivalent of 7.3. And we're done. And as you can see, most of the most of the overhead is in uh, in the handshake to set up and tear down the session, and um, and plowing through multiple messages is pretty quick. Um, so those weren't big messages by any means, but uh, but they're they're real traffic. Now I'm going to exit that. I'll just I don't have an HF radio with me, but I can show you what it looks like. So this window, would you'd see exactly the same stuff. The identification for the gateway might be different. Each gateway operator can, can put a little welcome message, and, and you can set time limits. So frequently, the HF welcome message will say, welcome to my gateway. You have 120 minutes of connect time left today. You know, stuff like that, little bookkeeping. I'm going to be down for maintenance tomorrow, stuff like that. Um, but otherwise, what you see in this window is exactly what you saw for VHF connection. What you see over here, if I actually had an HF rig hooked up to this, you would see a waterfall showing uh, two and a half kilohertz of spectrum. And uh, uh, Winmore 500 takes 500 hertz of bandwidth, and, uh, and 1600 takes 1600 hertz of bandwidth. So it fits in a standard SSB channel and complies with the, the symbol rate regulation that exists until the FCC decides to change it, which hopefully they will. Um, and if any CW operators want to get into an argument about symbol, weight, symbol rate uh, rulemaking, I'll be happy to argue with you after the session. Um, <clears throat> the, the short version is, for anybody who's not paying attention, uh, Folks who are uh, heavily into digital, like me, have petition petitioned the FCC to change the rules to allow uh, amateur radio digital transmissions to consume uh, uh, individual transmissions take a greater amount of bandwidth. And uh, there are uh, a number of vocal uh, traditional operators who think that digital is going to take over the amateur radio bands and HF bands and, and push out uh, code and, and uh, voice. And uh, so that's the debate that's going on right now, trying to find a, a balance. So what you would see here is an HF uh, is a waterfall, just like you'd see on, on any other, uh, an SDR or any one of the newer rigs that has a, a waterfall on it. Um, this is the same kind of um, uh, sort of constellation plot that you see. It's a, it tells you something about the quality of the signal that you're receiving. and. Uh, Receive level up here you can use to tune your receive. Uh, it detects other traffic, including non-Winmore traffic. So it will detect somebody doing PSK or RIDI uh, in the band pass that it intends to use and will tell you to wait. Uh, and in fact, if you try to go ahead and transmit, you have to click through a couple of other uh, are you sures before it'll go ahead and transmit when it thinks there's somebody already using the frequency. Yeah. And um, 
And occasionally it's fooled. You know, sometimes noise will convince it that there's somebody using the frequency, and, and you can tell by looking at it that it's not uh, real. You know, um, like uh, uh, like a switching power supply. You've all seen them. You know, the mm -hmm. the line. It looks a lot like a PSK signal, except that it's a little tilted, you know, it's drifting as the power supply warms up. And this thing think that, think, thinks that somebody's do, somebody doing PSK. And you just got to say, no, it's not. Transmit anyway. And then uh, down here you get some stats about uh, the goodness of the, of the connection uh, retry rate, that kind of stuff. And um, uh, so, it, you know, same as, otherwise it's the same as doing VHF. Yeah, questions? Seems to have half you might not know where the gateway would be because you just transmit all the frequency where there would be multiple gateways and you would choose the one that is at best perception. I'm glad you asked that question. Channel selection. All the HF gateways in the world. And, um, and so this, uh, in addition, if you're going to do HF, in addition to the Windlink software, you install this uh, propagation prediction software called I, IHTSFC, I think. It's a, it's, a, it's a freely available package written by, uh, I think, he, I'm pretty sure he's a ham. Uh, and it predicts uh, HF propagation based on current at atmospheric conditions. And so uh, every once in a while, you need to refresh your download of what the conditions are. Uh, and then it will compute both uh, what it thinks the reliability estimate is. So this is basically how many retries are you going to have to do uh, on that gateway. And, and uh, an overall sort of goodness of, of channel. I, I don't worry about the path quality. I, I usually pick by path reliability, because what I'm interested in is how many retries am I going to have higher to sit through better, before this yeah. thing's and higher is better, yeah. And uh, any color codes it so they color code it so you know you get yellow and red and further on down and it's red is what you would think it is. Don't even bother. Um, and then uh, you also get so you get what frequency the the um, that gateway is on. Uh, and most gateways monitor multiple frequencies. They, on HF, they scan. Uh, they, 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 they listen to a, a, an 80 meter frequency for a few seconds, and then they listen to their 40 meter for a few seconds, and then they go to 30, and then they go to 20. And so, so in that case, you, you see the call sign listed multiple times? Like right. Yeah. right, right, yeah, uh, W1EO, yeah. So W1EO is on 160 meters. And also on 80 meters, and probably every other band. Um, and if your uh, HF rig supports um, uh, uh, rig control, then then you just double click on the call sign. It tunes your rig to the right frequency, and and you're good to go. Yeah. No, this is the uh, the Winmore mode that you're going to work in, either Winmore 500 or Winmore 1600. So it's the bandwidth that you're going to occupy in that uh, in the waterfall. The uh, uh, not the vast majority of gateways are public, but it's possible to have gateways that are restricted to AMCOM use or restricted to maritime use. Uh, it's it's pretty common for um, for uh, small ocean-going sailboats. Uh, for the, the sailor who's out there by himself or two or three people, uh, for one of them to have a ham license and they'll have a, an HF uh, wind link set up on the boat so they can do email while they're at sea. And some gateways are restricted to maritime use and, uh, and some of them are, are restricted by time of day, which may have something to do with power availability or, or something like that. Is, is wind link what the Red Cross uses for that updating that database? <clears throat> Better heard something about that. The uh, 
Who's okay database? Oh, the safe and well? Yes, yeah. Safe and well. Yeah. Uh, in fact, so that these, tw I think in the end it was 22 teams of hams that went, two, two person teams that went to Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. uh, their go kits, every one of those 22 go kits had a wind link, uh, both VHF and HF wind link station in it. Yep. And so uh, they were taking safe and well messages, sending them via wind link to somebody at the Red Cross somewhere where there, there was oh, internet. Probably. And they were taking those, cutting and pasting, or they probably had written a program to automatically schlep the WinLink email into Safe and Well. And um, yeah, so that was WinLink that was doing that work. Yep. Uh, another nice feature of, of the, the WinMore is that within the, the bandwidth for the station that you're working, um, The system is capable of recognizing the robustness of the connection, and it can automatically change the actual uh, protocol that it's using in that mode. And, and, and I don't really understand those, those different protocols, but if you have a really good connection, it'll, it'll actually right. switch to a protocol that's more efficient and faster. Right. So this number is the maximum, but. Uh, Spectrum that'll be used by by that gateway. It it, it can also do five win more 500 on that frequency, and if it's a crummy, if, if there's a lot of noise, it'll drop back to 500. If it gets better, it'll it'll jump back up to 1600. Yeah. So it tries to and and RDOP is more granular. Uh, win more has two steps. It's either 500 or 1600, but RDOP uh, has multiple levels of. Of uh, speed, different modulation schemes to deal with different kinds of noise and and fade. Uh, so it's much more, it's it's better in pretty much every way. And then the other uh, last thing I wanted to show you, it also tells you how far away and and what bearing uh, the gateway is. So if you've got a beam, uh, you can also have it with digital control. You can have it swing your beam around to the the bearing for the gateway. Okay, so that is what I've got. So, so what, what was the email that you got? I'm not going to show you my email. It's private. Dear uh, time, I would guess that the one from John Porter is probably uh, thanking me for recording the meeting tonight. If he knows what's good for me, he was thanking me for recording the meeting tonight. Uh, or good for him, rather. Uh, and the other one, I didn't notice who it was from. Oh, it was from you. Uh -huh. Aha! Really All right. Very cool. Yeah. Oh, OK. So then really all you need is a rig and a PC, and you can get up and running. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like I say, the, the rig could be in your car. And in fact, for, for Aries use, that's actually a great solution. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, more, it's really useful. If we had a half a dozen people who were raring to go to do wind link from their car, um, then, and if you've got one of these Kenwoods in your car and a laptop, you're ready to go. All you need is cable. And that would actually be really useful in an emergency. Yeah. So my uh, takeaway here is that on a really high level, if the internet was to ever go out and we had made ourselves equipped with this, we could send emails, slow but very accurate, mm -hmm. emails to, to non-hand individuals mm -hmm. because we get back in the interlink and we don't know. Right. Or to other hands with so equipped. Or we could help emergency uh, organizations get their messages out to wherever mm -hmm. they want to. Right. Is that the yeah, that's a great takeaway. Yeah, uh, and I, I forgot to mention something. The the software can be configured in, in a receive only mode too. So it's possible to put a, a receive only wind link station someplace where you don't have an operator. Uh, and you could like an EOC, for example, if you just wanted to be able to send messages to an EOC, you could set up a receive only station and just have them pop out on a printer. When a message comes in, it just gets printed. It, that can be done. As well. So I think you were next. Most of it is um, piece is Windows. Uh, 
someone has taken WinLink Express, the software that I just used, mm -hmm. and ported it to the Mac. Uh, I've not tried it yet. And there is other software which is not as pretty for Linux, uh, but it works. You can do you can do WinLink on any of the three major operating system platforms. Uh, WinLink Express for Windows is the primary. Uh, piece of software that the Wind, uh, that the WinLink team supports and put they put most of their energy into that one. Uh, yeah. Speculatively, the ham radio operators at ARRL asked to go to Puerto Rico. Yeah. They were all asked to come down with WinLink. Right. Now, I don't know how how do they set up in Puerto Rico? It has no no gateways, nothing now. What's your speculation what happened? Uh, they were almost certainly doing HF. Uh, they were using HF to get back to gateways in, in the U.S. In probably. Miami or wherever? Yeah, yeah, or wherever. Somewhere in the southeast probably. Yeah. You know, you know, you can, yeah. Anywhere in the southeast would work. You know, you can work the Caribbean all day long from, from Virginia and Florida and, yeah. 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 So yeah, they, they hung an antenna in a tree, a dipole in a tree, and contacted an HF gateway someplace. Yeah, and I, I'm pretty sure they went with Pactor modems, so they were doing higher data rates than, than uh, I would do with the, the software HF modem, yeah. Thank you. Meetings over. Uh, if anybody wants to tinker with WinLink, I'm happy to sit and tinker, look at configurations. We can, if you want to install the driver, we can plug my radio into your computer and see if, see if it'll work. Well,